Thank you very much <coughs> to all of you for coming out uh, to the talk today uh, and to Dr. Brown for the invitation to uh, ACMCU, did I get a uh, for, for, uh, for hosting the talk and for uh, all of the, the, the behind the scenes that works, that, uh, all the work behind the scenes that goes into putting something like this together. Uh, I appreciate your patience with all of my emails and delay in response to emails. Um, so my talk today will focus on the construction of legal subjecthood in early Islamic law, more specifically the Hanafi legal school. In order to do so, I focus on several legal scenarios pertaining to marriage and sexuality in the legal works of an 11th century Hanafi legal jurist by the name of Muhammad bin Ahmed al sarasi In exploring his legal works, I'm interested in the gendered assumptions embedded in his legal thought and their role in legal hermeneutics. My exploration of al is informed by and intervenes in contemporary Muslim debates on gender and sexual ethics. Pre-modern Islamic legal texts continue to have a life in these ethical conversations and often play a central role in framing debates and determining possible outcomes. They're often seen as repositories of sacred knowledge, sites of resistance to Western hegemony, and a source for recovering a pre-colonial Muslim past. Understanding the legal construction of gender is thus of particular importance in intervening in these contemporary debates. For the purposes of this talk, I will focus on three legal scenarios in Asarafsi's legal text, Kitab al those three scenarios are the construction of normative maleness and femaleness in the legal definition of sexual intercourse, the impaired legal agency of an enslaved male subject in matters of marriage and sexuality, and the legal rulings pertaining to the covering of the female slave. I discuss these three scenarios in particular as they offer varied configurations of gendered legal subjecthood. So sort of four gendered legal subjecthood, sub, uh, four gendered legal subjects that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, which are the free adult male, the free adult female, the enslaved male, and the enslaved female. By placing these legal scenarios next to one another, I demonstrate that gendered legal subjects in Islamic law were varied and multiple. While normative maleness and normative femaleness were conceptualized along the act of passive binary, this binary construction shifted and reformulated when gender intersected with other social factors such as slavery, age, and social status. While free women, enslaved women, and enslaved men were all configured as passive subjects and could not possess the agency, autonomy, and control over self that was granted to the free adult male, they nonetheless differed from one another even in their passive legal construction. To make my argument more clear, let me turn to my first case, which is the construction of normative maleness and femaleness through the legal definition of illicit sexual intercourse, <coughs> or zina. In Islamic law, sexual intercourse between individuals is restricted to marriage or concubinage. This legal permissibility, however, is constructed along multiple gendered asymmetries. Free adult men are permitted polygynous marriages, so up to four wives, and unrestricted concubines if they have the financial means to do so. For the Hanafis, enslaved men, on the other hand, are only permitted two wives concurrently and do not retain the right to concubinage. Free and enslaved women were expected to be monogamous, uh, and free women could not, take, could not make sexual use of their enslaved um, or their male slaves, and the enslaved woman <coughs> had essentially no sexual agency to refuse being used sexually by her slave. All other sexual relationships are criminalized under the category of zina. The punishment is determined based on the legal status, uh, based on legal status, so things like age, enslavement, marital status, etc., of the individuals that are in, that are involved. The Hanafis are distinct from other Sunni legal schools in their legal definition of sexual intercourse. They distinguish between a legal common sense understanding of sex, be, uh, sorry, between a legal and a common sense understanding of sex. So there's this sort of discussion that sex has between there are sort of legal definition of what constitutes sexual intercourse, and then there's what commonly people would call uh, sex or what people would call zina that uh, is not of legal significance. Uh, so the uh, Hanafis distinguish between a legal and common sense understanding of sexual intercourse, arguing that a legally actionable act of sex must be characterized by three elements. A, it must be vaginally penetrative. So unlike the other Sunni legal schools, Hanafis did not classify anal intercourse as coming under zina. 
The penetrative act must be of a male legal subject who is legally and morally uh, account, uh, obligated or accountable, the, the, the technical legal languages that they're mukanda. And C, the locus of penetration must be legally construed as desirable. As in, the woman that is being penetrated must be seen as a woman who is desirable. For Hanafi jurists, the primary consideration that sets in motion the laws of zina was the legal status of the man. An illicit act of sexual intercourse was considered punishable only when the man could be held legally and morally accountable for his actions. That is, he was of legal majority and was considered legally safe. In such a conception of sexual intercourse, the law's consideration of a woman's participation in the sex act was entirely dependent on the legal status of the penetrating male. So to clarify, let's consider three possible cases of zina. Case A, the sexual violation of a woman by a free man, free adult man. Case B, sexual, viola sexual intercourse between a legally sane adult man uh, and a legally insane woman. So one, the male here would be legally uh, accountable and the woman would not be considered her insanity. And case C, sexual intercourse between a legally insane man and an adult woman. So now there's the opposite. The legally insane man is not legally accountable. Uh, but the woman who is an adult same woman would be accountable. It's a nice table uh, or to kind of uh, put the conclusions of these uh, cases. In cases A and B, there's no significant difference between the four different Sunni legal schools. In both cases, the man would be convicted of illicit sexual intercourse as he would be legally culpable. So uh, case A is where a man sexually violated uh, a woman. And uh, case B is where you had a uh, consensual sex between, oh sorry, you had, uh, you had a legally sane man who then has sex with a legally insane woman. So in the first case, the man would be punished, the woman would not because she was coerced. In the second case, the man would be punished, the woman would not because she is considered legally insane. Case C, however, is a point of significant difference. For the other Sunni legal schools, the man would be acquitted due to legal insanity and the woman convicted as she is legally culpable and willfully participated in the sex act. The Hanafis, however, would acquit both individuals in this case, holding neither legally culpable for their actions. Why is the woman not punished despite her willful participation in the illicit sex act? In justifying this position of the Hanafi legal school, Asarasi argues that the legal conception of sexual intercourse is dependent on the legal culpability of the active subject in the sex act, which is the man as the man is the immediate or direct acting agent, the woman is seen as subsidiary or a tabia, following the action of the man. In this conceptual framing, the very definition of sexual intercourse is dependent on the action of the man. He is not only the acting subject, quite literally the term uh, used is al-fa'il, but his participation, in fact, constitutes the very act of the source, the, sorry, the very source of the act itself. The woman, on the other hand, is conceptualized as the locus or the mahal, where the sex act occurs. Her culpability is established through her willful enablement of the sex act, so that's her agency in this, and that she makes herself available for penetration. In such a conception of sexual intercourse, if the male subject is not legally culpable, then his penetrative act carries no legal significance. In Asarasi's legal imagination, man is the active subject, the penetrator, whose intent and legal obligation are the primary concerns of the legal definition of sexual intercourse. Thus, in case C, the legal injunction of zina does not go into effect as the penetrative act was that of a man who was not legally culpable due to his insanity. While the woman did indeed willfully participate, she acted to enable sexual intercourse with a man whose actions have no legal significance. A Sarafsi's justification of the unique Hanafi position on sexual intercourse or illicit sexual intercourse establishes the characteristic of activity as a fundamental aspect of maleness. Legal discourse defines maleness through activity and femaleness through passivity. So this language of the fa'il and maf'ulbihi, or this language of the fa'il and the um, and the uh, mahal. This active passive binary forms the framework for reading the role of male and female bodies in the act of intercourse. This normative construction of maleness is disrupted, however, 
by other male legal subjects who are not marked by activity or activeness due to the constraint on their legal capacity. In order to demonstrate my point uh, clearly, let me turn to the enslaved male subject and explore his position within the legal construction of gender. Whereas the free adult man is a full legal agent, other configurations of the male subject, such as the male slave, are constrained in their legal agency. In Islamic law, slaves, both male and female, retain legal agency, but the, the, the capacity that they have is impaired by enslavement. Enslavement thus becomes a sufficient cause for avoiding religious and legal obligations. Enslavement not only restricts the rights and obligations of enslaved males, but also places them in an object status. In a world where relationships were conceived in hierarchies, enslaved men could not fully inhabit the active status associated with normative maleness. As Kisha Ali has noted, quote, an adult male's maleness, which would have given him full and sole control over his marital destiny if he were free, stood in tension with his status as a slave. Enslavement either feminized or infantilized the male with regard to consent. The legal status of the enslaved male presents a conundrum for this normative construction of, of maleness and femaleness. By virtue of his maleness, the enslaved male is characterized by activity. So in the case of Zina, for example, his penetrative act would set into motion legal proceedings. However, enslavement also impairs his legal capacity, placing him in both a subject and object position. This conundrum is most present in the issue of marriage, more particularly the inability of an enslaved man to marry. As I mentioned earlier, Islamic law legalizes fulfillment of sexual desire through, through two avenues alone marriage and concubinage. According to Hanafi law, enslaved people do not have the legal capacity to enjoy ownership rights. For an enslaved man, this creates a particular, a peculiar problem. Given that marriage is a contractual relationship in which the husband acquires ownership of sexual access to the wife, an enslaved man could neither contract a marriage nur take on a concubine. As Asarapsi states emphatically, quote, the male slave is a commodity that is owned so it is not permissible for him in turn to own a commodity. As the legal agency of the slave man is impaired by enslavement, he cannot inhabit or perform the maleness that is naturalized and normativized in the law. On the act of passive binary, the enslaved male is constructed as passive. This passive legal subjecthood is not particular to ownership rights over the marriage contract alone. Unlike the free adult male subject, the enslaved male cannot marry without the permission of his slave owner, who can also coerce him into marriage. Such is his passive subject position that marriage between an enslaved man and his female slave owner was a legal impossibility. As a slave owner, she occupied a position of dominion over him, making it impossible for him in turn to occupy such a position over her as a husband. In this relational construction of legal agency, it is the female slave owner who is an active legal subject and the enslaved male passive. Given this inability to inhabit and perform normative maleness, the enslaved male is left with no licit means of fulfilling his sexual desire. What avenues, if any then, are available to the enslaved male to engage in licit sexual intercourse? This legal conundrum is resolved to the creation of a legal fiction in which the enslaved male is treated as though he were in possession of ownership rights. This legal capacity for ownership is granted to the enslaved male only for the purposes of the marriage contract and does not extend to other circumstances and, and is dependent on the consent of the slave owner. <coughs> Interestingly, this fiction is necessitated and justified by the very legal narrative around gender normativity that the enslaved male is unable to occupy. He cannot marry because the marriage contract is constructed through normative maleness and femaleness in which males come to possess ownership over the, the wife or the husband comes to possess ownership over the wife's sexual commodity. As an enslaved male, he is of course unable to inhabit this. However, it is precisely the maleness of the enslaved male that allows for the fictive creation of his limited ownership rights. As Sarafsi argues that the enslaved male is able to garner the legal capacity to marry only so that he might fulfill his sexual desire licitly and ensure the propagation of his lineage, which he can only do uh, by having this uh, right of dominion. <coughs> 
In this discussion on the marriage, uh, on the marriage of the enslaved male, we can observe how the enslaved male traverses this act of passive binary. The legal subjecthood of the enslaved male is constructed at the intersection here of normative maleness and enslavement. So let me turn now to the enslaved female subject as legal, or the enslaved female as legal subject. As I've argued in the legal discussion on illicit sexual intercourse, normative femaleness is constructed as passive in relation to normative maleness. We saw this most explicitly in the conceptualization of the woman as the locus of penetration, the legal significance of her agency inextricably tied to the active agency of the male. For the enslaved female, her femaleness and her enslavement both configure her as passive. However, while both free and enslaved women share in this passive construction, they are differently configured as female legal subjects. To demonstrate this point, I will focus on two legal discussions. The first is the difference in legal rulings pertaining to male access to the female body. And secondly, different legal rulings pertaining to femaleness, sexual intercourse, and bodily autonomy. In a passage on the desire-bearing gaze, uh, another, a seraxi categorizes gazing into four categories. So you can have the gaze of a man upon another man, the gaze of a man upon a woman, the gaze of a woman upon a man, and the gaze of a man upon a woman. This last category, gaze of a man upon a woman, is given the most attention. So quite literally, there's a couple of pages on the first three categories, and then like six, seven pages on this last category. Um, is further divided into the gaze of a man upon four categories of women. So male gaze upon the wife or the concubine, uh, male gaze upon his female relatives, male gaze on female slaves of another, and male gaze on unrelated free women. The male gaze on a wife or concubine is presented as the least complex. It is permissible for a man to look upon the entire body of his wife or his female slave, whether that look is animated by desire or not, because um, it's a, it, it's a, that, that sort of look of desire has no legal or ethical consequence because he has access to her. Uh, what's interesting is that he then goes on to say that humans should never look at the full nakedness of another human's body. So there are certain kind of ethics of what uh, one should do even when you have a certain legal right. Uh, but nonetheless, in terms of the kind of legality of the issue here, uh, there is uh, no problem if he were to look upon her full naked body. With unrelated free women, slave women owned by others, and even, even female relatives, there are greater degrees of restrictions around bodily exposure and physical contact. Aserxi asserts that the normative condition of femaleness is one of concealment. He states quite emphatically, quote, from her head to her feet, a woman is aura. This construction of the female body is, as aura is produced through the male gaze, which views the female body as always desirable. For a Sarafsi, male desire is all pervasive and potentially present in any relationship between men and women. He does not consider women of any age to be beyond temptation and admits the possibility of incestuous desire even for female relatives. So he's adamant that bodily exposure between a man and his female relatives is only permissible if they're absolutely sure that there's no presence of sexual desire. And this is uh, Mary Katz in her book, uh, Women in the Mosque, talks about to um, come as sort of being this turning point where you see uh, conversations about older women being less desirable and thus having access to the mosque starting to turn into more of a monolithic category of all women as desirable regardless of their age. Uh, so he's kind of sitting at this particular point in the development of legal discourse. Asarasi's narrative about this normative female condition of concealment is complicated, however, if we turn our attention to his discussion about the male gaze on a female slave, that is a female slave that he doesn't own. The female slave, due to her enslavement, is unable to embody this concealment that is so defining of femaleness. In considering the parameters of the male gaze on a slave woman, Asarasi argues that it is permissible for a man to look upon the enslaved woman's body except for her torso, upper thighs, and genitals. Given that men are prohibited to look upon unrelated free women, why are they permitted to do so when the woman is enslaved? In providing a legal justification for this significant <laughs> exposure, Asarasi relies on uh, the enslaved woman's legal status as an enslaved person. As she must often emerge in public to serve the needs of her owner, 
to demand that she cover her entire body would put undue restrictions on her mobility. Given the legal status and life circumstances of the enslaved female, she cannot embody the mode of concealment that is mandated on free women and is therefore permitted greater bodily exposure. It is important to point out here that while Asarasi's narrative about bodily exposure is construed as a matter of easing the mobility of enslaved women, the fact that men are granted permission to look upon her body, rather than say giving her the agency to make determinations on, based on her needs, <clears throat> suggests that clothing and bodily exposure are, indeed, are instead markers of her slave status. This is most apparent when we consider the legal permission not only to look upon, but also touch the enslaved woman's body. Asarasi argues that as the enslaved woman is bought and sold on the market, she must be available for inspection through both looking and touching. In fact, her commodification is so critical to her, her legal subjecthood that while Asarasi stipulates the man can touch the enslaved woman only if the touch is not desirous, the desire-bearing gaze is not similarly prohibited. So he can't touch her if that touch is animated by desire, but he can look upon her with desire. He states quite explicitly that in commercial transactions, one must be able to look upon the commodity in order to ascertain its appropriate value. Thus, to prohibit both touching and the desirous gaze would make such financial transactions difficult. While normative femaleness is defined by full concealment of the body, the enslaved female cannot, in fact, is not permitted to embody that concealment. In linking the bodily exposure of the enslaved woman to the slave market, Asarasi makes clear <clears throat> that this bodily exposure is in fact mandated on the enslaved woman. While the law requires particular modes of covering for both free women and enslaved women, so it's not as though free women have the agency to decide whether they want to cover or not, there's also a mandate on them to cover in particular ways, so both of them are mandated by the law. It grants greater bodily autonomy to the free woman who, as Hina Azam has argued in her book, uh, sexual violation in Islamic law, the free woman comes to hold ownership over her own sexual commodity, which is not transacted on the slave market. We can see more clearly this difference in the bodily dignity and autonomy of the free woman if we return to the legal discussion on the marriage of enslaved individuals. Unlike the male slave who needed to come into possession of ownership rights to marry, enslavement only further facilitates the passive status of the enslaved female. In fact, as the marriage contract necessitates an active male subject and a, female, and a passive female subject, it links women's fulfillment of sexual desire with domination. Among the Sunni legal schools, the Hanafis are perhaps the most attuned to this predicament for women. As Sarasi states quite candidly, quote, the establishment of dominion, that is the dominion of marriage, over the woman is a form of humiliation. Later in the same discussion, he quotes a prophetic tradition that equates marriage with slavery. This relation between marriage and humiliation and the domination established over the wife raises the question as to why a woman, and particularly a free woman, would agree to enter into such a relationship. The ethical dilemma is particularly pronounced if we consider that while Islamic law permitted slavery, it recognized freedom as the fundamental condition of each human being, as well as the preferred means of social existence, what humans would prefer for themselves. That is, Muslim jurists held that freedom grants individuals a dignity that they should not willingly abandon. Recognizing that enslavement is a humiliating condition, the Quran and prophetic practice encourage an, an, an ethic of manumission. Given this broader conception of human dignity, why does the law require women, and free women in particular, to compromise their autonomy in order to fulfill their sexual desire? Asarasi's response to this ethical dilemma is to construct a narrative about social order and impending chaos to justify this gendered hierarchy. God, he argues, has endowed human, humans with sexual desire so that they might procreate and fulfill, intentionally or unintentionally, the divine command for the continued existence of humanity. Sexual intercourse without constraints, however, brings with it the, protect, the potential of tremendous social chaos. Sexual intercourse and procreation outside of a relationship of dominion and exclusive sexual access to the woman would result in uncertainty about a child's lineage. With men uncertain whether a child is theirs, quote unquote, they would forsake the protection and financial maintenance of women and children. 
a society in which women are the ones who are financially responsible for themselves and their children would be a society in complete chaos. But no, is that what she uses? If women, he argues, were obligated to provide for themselves, they would indeed turn to sex work. The only way then of ensuring that men provide protection and financial maintenance to women and children is to constrain sexual intercourse to only those relationships where the man holds dominion over the woman so that lineage can be ascribed to the father who will then provide for them financially. Now, of course, this is a lot more complicated because uh, uh, you can ascribe lineage to a child even though biologically you can recognize that that child does not belong to the father, but the marriage, right? So there's a fiction there that is at work, but ideally this is the sort of narrative that he's telling. It is this narrative of impending social chaos that necessitates that free women surrender their autonomy in order to fulfill their sexual desire. While both free and enslaved women are constructed as passive legal subjects, the discussion on bodily exposure and sexual autonomy demonstrates that they are in fact differently constructed as female legal subjects. Freedom grants greater agency and autonomy to the free adult woman Enslaved females were bought and sold on the, on the slave market and thus did not have the right to prevent men from touching them and looking upon them. They could be used by their slave owners as concubines and could also be coerced into marriage. Free adult women, on the other hand, had ownership over their own sexual commodity. They transacted their sexual commodity and surrendered their bodily autonomy of their own volition. Now, age plays a big factor in this, which is something um, that I'm considering, but here in relation to the free and the enslaved woman, uh, there is that kind of autonomy that she, uh, that she holds. The enslaved female, however, has no such right over her sexuality. It is for this reason that upon emancipation, she acquires the legal agency to choose whether to remain in a marriage that was contracted while she was enslaved. So prior to starting graduate school, I spent a considerable amount of time in Egypt studying Arabic and familiarizing myself with Islamic legal texts. While there, I, like many other Islamic law nerds, for those of you who uh, spent time in the Middle East studying will relate to this, spent countless hours in these bookstores, perusing through uh, the pre-modern legal texts. While my primary interest was in acquiring pre-modern legal texts, I would also look through secondary literature, as well as books focused more specifically on gender in Islamic law. As I familiarized myself with this literature, I was struck by the number of contemporary books that focused on legal rulings pertaining to women. So this is, you get an innumerable number of books that have these titles of Fiqh nisa or Hakam nisa So it's like the, the, the legal rulings pertaining to women or um, the Fiqh of, of women. These texts either collated legal opinions or thematically organized legal rulings concerning women. As my familiarity with the pre-modern Islamic legal texts grew, I began to wonder why gender was not particularized in the thematic organization of those texts. I was also hard pressed to find too many pre-modern legal texts that, that did this sort of exclusive focus just on women. If Islam, as modern Muslim religious discourse often claims, has laid out clearly differentiated gender roles for men and women, then thematically organizing legal rulings based on gender would be of most benefit to individuals, all the rules pertaining to your life in one book. These observations between pre-modern and contemporary legal texts stayed with me as I entered my doctoral program. As I developed my dissertation project, an interrogation into desiring subjects in a set of some legal works, I became particularly interested in the gender assumptions made by Muslim jurists that informed legal rulings pertaining to women. Like much of contemporary Muslim discourse on Islamic law, I too assumed that gender in Islamic law was constructed along a gender binary, that is male and female. The chapters of the dissertation thus focused on male subjects of desire was one chapter, female subjects of desire was a second chapter, uh, and then there was one other chapter that was exploring how the law problematized intersex bodies that belied representation in this gender binary. As I concluded my dissertation, however, I came to the realization that gender for Asafsi was not singular, but instead multiple and varied. Normative maleness and femaleness intersect with different social factors to produce multiple gendered subjects. For this talk, I focus on enslavement as one of those so of social factors, but my book talks also about um, age and social status. Marion Cass and Judith Tucker have both noticed that they, uh, both noted that there is no singular female subject of Islamic law. 
Judith Tucker has argued that women's agency as legal subjects is only hampered by the interests of the family and a patriarchal society. This is particularly evidenced in the woman's legal agency in matters pertaining to marriage and divorce. In other aspects of the law, particularly those related to property rights, women exercise full autonomy as legal agents. Marion Katz also observes this shifting legal agency and brings into question the very category of woman in the law. In tracing the development of Sunni legal thought on the question of women's mosque attendance, she argues that in the first two centuries of Islamic law, woman was not a homogenous category. At this early moment of the law's development, the concept of the woman always intersected with other factors such as age and enslavement. The multiple constructions of gendered legal subjecthood in Asrasi's legal text led me to interrogate my own assumptions about gender and its salience as a category of analysis in the study of early Islamic law. Looking at the varied manifestations of gendered legal subjects, it is clear that gender in Islamic legal discourse is not always the most salient category in explicating how human existence was imagined or how social relations were ordered. Gender is but one of the multiple categories that construct legal subject code. My observation here is informed by the work of decolonial uh, feminists and feminist historians who have challenged us to critically interrogate and historically contextualize the gender binary. In her article, Gender as a Category of Historical Analysis, Jean Boydston cautions that gender as a named category now functions as a set of universal premises, flattening complex historical processes and meanings. She argues that feminist historiography has treated gender as, quote, non-historically contingent, that is, as unfolding in much the same way, in much the same terms in all societies. Such historical accounts disregard the very local character of the concept, instead taking the local that is particular to modernity and particularly Western modernity and universalizing it. In her book, The Invention of Women, Making an African Sense of Western Gender Discourses, Oyeronke Oyewumi also urges us to consider that if we take seriously that gender is a social construction, then gender cannot operate in the same way across time and space. In her historical account of gender in pre-colonial Yoruba society, she argues that systems of distinction other than male and female were important, often more important, as the primary symbols for the ordering and structuring of society and power relations. Oyewumi refers to these different matrices as social facts, noting the different ways in which gender in Yoruba society is constructed alongside these social facts. In the context of Native American conceptions of gender, historical studies have shown that while the male-female binary certainly existed, it was not more salient than other binaries, such as war and peace, young and old, or plant and animal. These studies challenge our assumptions that gender binary is always the primary signifier or a different differential relation of power. Turning to the Islamic context, context Afsani Najmabadi also pushes, pushes against the ethnocentricity of gender as a category of historical analysis. Describing her investigation into the work of gender in the formation of Iranian modernity, she asserts that she first had to break free of the narrative implicit in the category of gender. This was necessary in order to show how thinking of gender as the binary construction of man and woman was a production of early modern Iran. The gender binary as we understand it was not the cultural logic of gender for pre-modern Iran. There was a shift, she argues, from a pre-modern logic in which, quote, all gender categories were defined in relation to adult manhood to a view in which woman and man became opposite and complementary to the exclusion of other categories that would not fit. In, take, in, in taking on Boyston and Najmabadi's theoretical critique, I do not wish to argue that gender is not a salient category for Islamic law. Indeed, I take seriously Asarsi's claim that gender is a fundamental distinguishing factor in humans. Asarsi himself routinely employs the terms male or man or female or woman to refer to gender as universal categories, regardless of the, of the distinctions between different types of men and women in the law. In fact, he is adamant that the male and female are fundamentally different from one another. In an intriguing statement, he asserts her. Quote, the male and the female of Adam's children are legally too generic, because the purpose which is assigned to one cannot be realized by the other. The function assigned to the female slave is concubinage and the production of children, 
and a male slave cannot do anything of this. Despite the difference in the status granted to free and slave subjects in the law, they are united along gendered lines. For as the difference of purpose assigned to each gender is a definitive distinguishing feature between men, male, and female. Thus, while freedom is a natural condition of the human, slavery is a temporary impediment. Once a male slave is freed, he acquires the same status as the free adult male subject. And this is something I'm working on right now in this chapter of the book on social status, because I'm not entirely sure that that's always true, because in some of the discussions on pifa, uh, on compatibility in marriage, you can have conversations about how rip or enslavement sort of remains in one's lineage for a while. Uh, and so there, there isn't compatibility between people who come from lineage of freedom and, and, and enslavement. But, um, ideally at least in the legal theoretical uh, uh, conversation, once that impediment is removed, the, the enslaved man who now becomes free would have uh, full legal agency as uh, any free adult male. Would. While there are differences in the legal status and agency, oh, sorry, so once a male uh, slave is free, he acquires the same status as the free adult male subject. Femaleness, however, is a permanent impediment. While there are differences in the legal agency and, and status of the free woman and the female slave, neither one can ever stop being a woman. Femaleness is the most enduring impediment to women's legal agency. Despite this insistence on the fundamental difference between the male and the female, however, legal discourse still constructed multiple male subjects and multiple female subjects. As Fatma Sidat has noted in her study of female legal capacity or ahliya in Islamic legal theory, so in the usul literature and not the furu literature, uh, which I'm looking at, the substantive um, legal text. So she argues, the female legal subject of Islamic law is not a simply or singularly constituted legal subject that moves in time with the legal identity of woman. The evidence supports a notion of subjectivity that is multiple and changing even if the biological female person holding the differing legal subjectivity is constant. In early Islamic legal discourse, it was not biological sex, but instead gender roles that were the determining factor of social existence. And here I'm borrowing uh, from the work of Thomas uh, Lecure um, in his book, Making Sex, Body, uh, and Gender from the Greeks to the Poet, who makes a similar argument. These gender roles meticulously legislated by the law were, determined, were not determined by biological sex alone, but varying social factors that conditioned and shaped the lives of individuals. Muslim feminist critiques of Islamic law have demonstrated the gendered assumptions and patriarchal nature of legal discourse. They have also raised crucial questions about the dissonance between pre-modern and contemporary gender cosmologies and the injustices that ensue from an uncritical observance to the pre-modern legal textual tradition. In furthering this conversation, my work offers an account of the construction of gender in early Islamic legal discourse that calls on Muslim feminists to critically interrogate the categories we employ. As Muslim feminist engagement with the pre-modern Islamic legal, oh, any Muslim feminist engagement with the pre-modern Islamic legal discourse must account for this fluidity of gender in the pre-modern, uh, in these pre-modern texts. So one of the things that I'm developing uh, at, in the last chapter of the, of, of the book, and this is just recently a development, is trying to think about different modes of engagement that Muslim feminists can have with this legal tradition. Generally, uh, the, that, that kind of mode has been one of critique. I'm trying to think now about modes of a recuperative way of thinking about these texts, but that's something that is really just kind of uh, uh, very much uh, at, at beginning levels of what I'm thinking about, so I, I don't want to present on that here, but I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, in question and answers, but I did want to present some of this work thinking about the categories that uh, are employed in the study of Islamic law. So I'll end on that. Thank you very much.